Hello, my name is Jessica Adnich, and I am the Senior Marketing Director for Reflex Protect. Today we're going to talk about safety in healthcare, and today joining me uh, is Joe Anderson and Sean Paul. If you guys wouldn't mind uh, sharing what you guys do in your current position. I'm Joe Anderson. I'm the CEO of Reflex Protect. Hi, I'm Sean Paul. I'm a, a healthcare security specialist, uh, currently a director of physical security, safety, and emergency management for a large healthcare organization inside the United States. Wonderful. Well, thank you both so much for being here today to talk about this topic. It's a really, really important topic to, um, in today's society. So, Sean, when it comes to workplace violence in hospitals and healthcare facilities, can you help frame this issue and tell us how prevalent the problem really is? Yeah, I, I mean, let's let's talk pre-COVID, right? Pre-COVID, th there was always, already a huge concern in healthcare. Healthcare workers are the number one victims of workplace violence across the country of all professions. 75% of workplace violence in, in the United States is directed towards healthcare. So it, it's a huge prevalent issue. Now let's throw COVID on top of that. You put the pressures of these more stressful situations. You put the pressures of denying visitors, people who have problems seeing loved ones at end of life situations and, and trying to control that stress and that flow of visitors coming in and out of the hospital has just elevated the issue um, and made something that was already emotional and personal all that more stressful for not only the, the healthcare workers, but also for the, the patients and also for the visitors. So it, it, it's, it's really just uh, exploding right now. Yeah, I would, I would say so. Um, it's a very compounded problem. Do you think that healthcare safety and security is really getting the attention it deserves right now? You know, it's hard. Uh, hospitals are stressed. Hospitals are stressed for resources. Hospitals are stressed uh, for money, hospital stress for personnel. I, I, I personally know of one particular uh, location where uh, it's a smaller security group and you know they, they had 70 officers that were out with COVID. When you're at that front door and somebody shows up and they're coughing and sneezing and hacking, you know, you're, you're caught off guard. You, you can't quickly get your, your personal protective equipment, your PPE on. So you're just at this higher risk. Never mind. Let's talk about working with some of the, you know, uh, more aggressive mental health situations or intoxicated people, and they're reaching and grabbing and pulling your mask and tearing off your your gowns and tearing gloves. It's really hard to stay protected. Um, so the, the pressures are are just really there, and we have to continue to monitor that and continue to be proactive. But it's really hard for organizations right now to invest in that time and money in training. Uh, I was involved in a particular training recently, and we weren't able to do the hands-on portion of it. And it's so important to do the hands-on portion of it because that's that, that mechanical mechanism of, uh, of releasing a grab, releasing a bite, releasing a, a hair pull. How do you defend yourself against somebody who, who's punching and yelling and screaming and pulling? And all this virtual training is great, but it doesn't give that hands-on that you need to truly practice this, especially when you're looking, you know, nurses weren't trained to do this. So how do you get that repetition of them practicing these things for that stressful situation when somebody does grab onto their arm or does pull their hair or start to strangle them with their stethoscope? And if they haven't had chances to, to, to walk through that and practice it during those st stressful situations, it just puts them more at risk. So. Healthcare knows it. It's an issue. We have resources, but we need more time for training. We need more support in the security industry. And by all means, get the training up front before new people get on the floor. Yeah, that, that makes complete sense. Um, so for people who aren't familiar with this um, issue, because it is a very large issue, pre-COVID, during COVID, and you mentioned some of these factors in, in what you just said, but what kind of things contribute to the actual workplace violence against nurses and staff? Is it patients? Is it visitors? Is it, you know, what kind of things happen? Because I think a lot of people don't really realize that this is a serious issue that happens every day to people that are on the front lines. Yeah, th there's external factors and there's internal factors, right? L let's look at one of the external ones. Uh, essentially, hospitals, emergency departments are dumping 
of course. You get a call of the person who's intoxicated, who might be doing some vandalism, but they're too intoxicated to safely go to prison, or, or I'm sorry, to you know your local county jail or, si or city jail. They have to go to the hospital first. And, th and then they're released because they can't go to jail because they're too intoxicated. Therefore, now the hospital is responsible for caring for that patient, now person, who was just arrested. But they're unsafe to go to jail. But now you have nurses and caregivers taking care of this person instead of law enforcement. So that law enforcement dumping ground is definitely an issue. It's putting a lot of pressure on the emergency departments. But let's also look at, at a statistic of since the 1950s, we have lost 90% of our inpatient beds for mental health. We, as, as um, an industry in healthcare, have a mental health crisis going on right now where people are left to, their, to manage these systems outside of hospitals on their own. And at the same time, these programs, these outpatient services are being cut and they're not being funded. So when, when somebody is responsible for getting to their appointments, picking up their prescription, going and getting their prescription and paying for their prescription and then remembering to take all their medication. It's very hard for people to manage that. Never mind when it's now hard to get to because there's less access. So we end up in clinical care settings, taking care of mental health patients and the people don't have the training to deal with the mental health patients. So how now are, are we providing additional training to deal with the mental health community that it is just so prevalent and, and, and coming to the hospital, rightfully so, for help, but in crisis. And then you don't have the mental health facilities or nor the training to, to safely uh, work with those particular patients. Yeah, that, that's, um, that's a lot of, of issues stacked on top of each other. I appreciate you sharing that information because, like I said, not a lot of people understand that. So after going over all of that, Joe, how about we, we talk about how to solve the problem? How does a non-lethal self-defense spray become safe enough for a hospital to use? That seems incredibly unique. It, it, it is. Uh, it, it really is. I mean, and, and I'm, I'm so happy to, to be here with Sean because um, he, he, in a, he's been actually extremely important in the, in the evolution of the product. Um, when we began Reflex Protect, we had the, um, the Reflex Technology spray head. This was meant to be a better deployment device, make it easier for somebody to just grab and use a pepper spray um, as an alternative to a loaded gun in a nightstand drawer or things like that. I also felt it could be good for, for businesses um, and, and, and other places like that. And one of the first people that I happened to be introduced to was in fact Sean. And, and I went in and I, I showed him what we had and, and he started telling me everything that was wrong with it. And I, I was wondering why, why is this person criticizing my, my nice spray head? He, you know, he wasn't criticizing the spray head. He was criticizing everything else about it. I'm like, why am I having this meeting? And Sean explained to me exactly what he just explained to all of us. And what that really did uh, is allowed us to look at a problem that had been an intractable one for years. And Sean gave us some directions about how we could look at this in a new way and essentially gave us a, a list uh, and said, you know, if it, the pepper spray doesn't work, it gets everywhere. It gets into the HVAC. It it, it cross contaminates. We can't use pepper spray. Period. Um, can you find something else? Uh, also, at the end of the day, we need to be able to clean everybody up really, really quickly and clean up the facility. We can't shut down a facility um, because we we had to protect ourselves against uh, 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 this workplace violence. Um, can you have a decontaminant that uh, that works better than anything we've seen before? Uh, and and then we're going to need some training. And and he kind of sent me on my way. And uh, I was working with a whole host of of great people. And we now had uh, sort of a specific mission to create something new. And, and, and we did. We developed Presidia Gel, uh, which is uh, it's the same active ingredient as used in, in other defense sprays, um, but it doesn't cross contaminate. Uh, we made a particularly sticky formula so that uh, it will only affect the person that it's directed at. We made it highly accurate. The spray head helps with that. Um, and then we created a uh, an all new 
um, decontaminant formula, the reflex remove that makes it go away within just minutes. And Sean came and uh, and joined us uh, a, a few weeks later, and we showed him everything we had. Um, and you know, his his response was, actually, I think I think this might work. Uh, let's let's try it out. Um, and so we. We, we, you know, started doing a pilot program there in, in his hospital uh, to begin with. Uh, and, and it turned out that, in fact, this was a new way of allowing not just security to be able to, um, to be more gentle uh, with, uh, with the, if it's a patient that's going, I mean, if it's just a bad person, you know, okay, it, it's, it's what it is. But with, with healthcare, many times it was actually somebody who was in crisis. You didn't want them to be hurt. You didn't want, you didn't want anything bad to happen to them, but neither should the caregiver get beat up. So the solution was to be able to do something where from a distance you could exercise controlling force over that person, um, but then once they were restrained, bring them back uh, very, very quickly and, and have it be over with. And it was a much more compassionate form um, of controlling force that seemed to begin to work for healthcare. And as a result, we, we developed what was originally a product um, just intended for, for everyday consumers as something specifically for the hospital setting. And, and it's turned out really very well. That's just absolutely fantastic. I mean, talk about an amazing story of problem solving, two areas coming together and American, you know, innovation. So Sean, can you share how the products of Reflex Protect, Presidia Gel and Reflex Remove, which is the decontaminant, how they fit into the overall strategy of keeping healthcare workers safe and unharmed? Yeah, right. I, I mean, this is, this is a tool and this is only a, a part of the answer. Um, you know, you have to have training, you have to have verbal, nonverbal de-escalation. But then when it comes to that physical intervention, it takes a lot of time to become proficient with some of these so-called, you know, martial art type maneuvers of, of wrist, wrist twists and, and headlocks and, and blocking kicks and punches. So this, what do you do when there has to be physical intervention to keep that patient or that person or that visitor or that intruder from actively harming others or the fear of harming others and how do they protect themselves? And nurses didn't sign up for this. The last thing they wanna do is have to physically fight and hurt somebody. A pharmacist who somebody is, is aggressively trying to jump over their counter to get to their drugs and to hurt them so they can get to their drugs. How do you train them to physically defend themselves? Because he, here's the problem. Most people say, well, I'm gonna hit my panic button. Most people say, well, I'm gonna call security. Most people say, I don't know what I'm gonna, do. I'm gonna do. I don't have a plan. But if you hit that panic button, it's what? Even if you have security in your hospital, two, three minutes, maybe four or five before security actually gets to you sometimes depending upon where you are in the facility. So we needed something one, to emphasize the fact that you are your first responder. What is your plan? If somebody comes in here right now in this emergency department and begins to actively harm you or somebody else, what are you going to do to protect yourself and protect others? And you have to do it. So rule one, you're your first responder. Two, we needed a tool that will do it right, do it quickly, and like Joe said, not cross-contaminate and impact everybody else in the facility. So this was that tool that we provided them to physically pr um, protect themselves and others, and they have it and they're ready to use it and they're trained to use it. Because it, in a stressful situ uh, situation, you're thinking of ability to be able to react. But if you have a plan, and if you put that in your thought process and you've walked through that imagery of using that product and understand how easy it is to use and to walk through the trigger mechanisms, the safety, and then point and spray and shoot and to see that you can stop somebody from 10 to 15 to 20 feet away, you now have the answer to one of the most stressful situations that you were about to, to deal with or worry about every day. Some of these clinics that, you know, we talked about some of the the concerns in healthcare and what, what drives, you know, some of this workplace violence. 
Healthcare is the number one reason for bankruptcy in the United States. When people walk into our cancer clinics, when people walk into our, our heart institutes, they're already stressed. Therefore, the people sitting at the desk, the staff that's there at the desk, and they deal with these uh, people that are aggressive, that are concerned, that are anxious, they didn't have a plan and they didn't know what to do. But now we've walked them through the training. We walk them with how to use it. We've walked through when to use it. And we've actually put a practice can in their hand and have them practice using it and spraying it. We've now, this is the next important part, empowered them to respond, to have a plan and to protect themselves or others. So now they go about their day being more relaxed and not so anxious about what am I going to do in that dangerous situation? Because they know what they're gonna do and they've seen it work and work well. That is literally the word that I was gonna use was empowerment. I think that that's absolutely, uh, it's perfect because if you can empower them that, takes them, that takes the stress off and allows them to do their job even better. Can you- And that's the response that we yeah. get in the training. I feel empowered and I know I can survive the situation. Before I didn't know what I was gonna do, now I know what I'm gonna do. Which, which is great. Can you give us some specific scenarios that this has been successful and you've seen that empowerment work? Yeah, absolutely. You know, uh, first and foremost, let's just go to the security side of it, right? Um, security officers, there's this fine line, especially if somebody's not a patient, of when do you respond to, to criminal activity? What, what do you do when somebody is threatening you? You don't always have to point and spray this for it to be effective. Just at being in a security officer's hand or in a nurse's hand, that's a level of force that the, the intruder or whoever it might be sees, whoa, hey, what's that? And I've seen security officers just have this down at their side and people back away and leave the property from doing what they were doing. Uh, I've also ha have had reports and, and have watched video of an officer who was being threatened with a bicycle and the person was going to throw it at this particular officer. And the officer took out the spray and pointed at the person and said, you need to put that down or leave the property or I'm going to spray you. And the person put the bike down, got on it and rode away versus physically confronting that security officer who, who happened to be by themselves. So it's used just even as a deterrent without being sprayed. Now there's one particular situation that I'm familiar with where it was in an emergency department, a uh, um, homeless person came in, uh, that homeless person was known to be aggressive in the past. And when they confronted the homeless person in a small exam room with other caregivers in that room and security in the room, they wanted to remove a stick that he had with him away from him because they were concerned about his violence. When they did that, he immediately stood up, he immediately began to escalate, he immediately began to swing that stick at caregivers. They were actually going to transition to a taser when they realized they wouldn't be able to use a taser because of all the clothes that was on this individual. So they, they, uh, another officer who was trained in Reflex Protect then used the product as intended to keep this person from causing physical harm to other people. It actually turned into a clinical event, which was to help this person into a criminal event where this person is now physically assaulting people with this tool, with this weapon, a stick. And it did exactly as intended. What Joe and I needed it to do from the beginning in our conversations, it stopped that person immediately. No one other person in the small exam room was contaminated. The person went down to the ground. They immediately secured him and then immediately used reflex remove to decontaminate him, to decontaminate a little bit of the floor that had uh, the product and the wall that had the product. And then to, again, transfer right back to that compassionate care. It literally took just a couple minutes to subdue the person, to decontaminate the person and to get back to healthcare. So it was just a tremendous win. And then I'm gonna share one more story, right? You know, here you are, I'm a retired law enforcement officer. I've got guns in the house, but they're locked up. I got kids, I, I, I have two teenage daughters, so I can't have those guns out. They have friends over, et cetera. So I have them locked up, which I've walked through. Okay, where's my key? Where's my gun? I'm a, how do you put it um, in battery, ready to go? 
but it takes a little bit. So here I am working from home with COVID, not going in, into the hospital at this current time. And I hear my wife yell outside and is calling my name. And as she does that, I look to my left, which is a big bay window that goes out into my yard. And a person who is in a pair of shorts, who is, you can tell, has dirt or grease or something on him, definitely uh, something was wrong as he jumps the fence. Well, hearing my wife yell, he starts to move towards my backyard where my wife is. I immediately think he's going after my wife. Something is wrong here. He's jumped my fence. He's in the yard. And my wife is calling for help. So as I go in my room, I'm like, wait a second. I can grab the key. I can grab my gun, but that's going to take a couple minutes. But right there in my dresser was my reflex protect because I feel safe having that out in and around the kids because I have a decontaminant if it's used by mistake. But I immediately grabbed that. I was outside in just a couple of seconds. I was able to get through my gate and confront this person right away. And then he immediately saw me that I had something in my hand. He saw that I had the ability to protect myself and my family. And being a law enforcement officer, I then went into that cop mode of get down to the ground, you know, put your hands out to your side, spread your legs apart, yelling over neighbors to give me help. But I tell you what, it was how fast I could get out there with this that kept him getting in the backyard where my wife was. Um, to where there was just some of those uh, logistical issues of getting to my gun in time. Never mind if I had to shoot him, then I'm dealing with that, you know, in my yard in front of my family. To where if I would have had to use this and actually spray it, it wouldn't have been such a, a, a traumatic situation, you know, to my wife and my family and myself. So it, it gave me a tool to use. It gave me a tool that is out and in my house that is safe that I, I could put into um, operation quickly. And at the same time, something that wouldn't have been so dramatic if I would have had to actually end up using it and, and not shoot somebody in front of my family, but actually, um, you know, uh, take them out at, at, as a as a concern and as a threat with, with something that I think is is considered to be uh, more humane or compassionate and, and easier to live with after the fact. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing those stories. I, I appreciate that you also shared that last one, that personal one, because I think that one of the big takeaways is is that whether it's healthcare or your home or personal security, being prepared is a huge, huge thing. So speaking about preparedness, Joe, how do you help your healthcare uh, clients implement this solution into their workplace to help them be prepared? Well, it, it's, it's really offering hopefully a, a turnkey solution. Um, I mean, it, it began by saying, you know, we can we can provide you with uh, with these tools that you can use. But Sean immediately pointed out uh, that that, you know, the tool is only as good as the confidence the person has in their ability to use it. Um, and so we, uh, we 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 determined that we had to do that really from from day one, from the initial contact uh, with the with the healthcare providers, and and it's true that you know once once we proved this was hospital safe, uh, lots of other places became interested in it. Uh, it's been the solution to the arm the teachers debate in schools. Um, yeah, lots of churches and other houses of worship have uh, have implemented it, um, and and they all kind of want the same type of thing, which is show me how I'm going to be able to use this. Show me how I can have the type of confidence with it um, that Sean had. Uh, and, and that really begins uh, with policies and procedures right at the outset to say, okay, let's look at what your policies and procedures are now. Um, you know, what you have, if you have anything. Um, they're usually all specific to locations. <clears throat> a rural hospital might have a, a very different set of procedures than a, a metro hospital. In fact, undoubtedly would. So to look at their existing policies from procedures and see what we need to do to be able to implement this kind of an active defense solution. It says we're going to actually, whether it's just with security or with security and um, and uh, frontline personnel, we're going to give them access to um, these tools. And then we're going to train them in how to use these tools. And uh, originally we would go in uh, with our, our people and, and we'd train up some people, usually some security people, sort of a train the trainer uh, and get them trained up then to train their own personnel. Um, and we began offering that online as well. 
um, which became incredibly important during the age of COVID because we could no longer send our people in, but we have very strong uh, video training opportunities and we can get into more detail about that later that we can do online and train up personnel there who can then train their own personnel in their own time. And we can walk them through it from beginning to end and customize it to their needs. And what's been interesting is the feedback that we've received from healthcare workers about what their needs were. For example, um, in addition to all we've been talking about here with workplace violence, most of the caregivers said, you know, on an average day, the most dangerous part of my day isn't going to come from a patient or anybody else. It's going to come on my walk to and from my car at shift change. And in fact, there was a recent article, um, a, a big expose uh, by a Pulitzer Prize winner about healthcare security. One of the first big articles we've actually seen on the subject that has been kind of a secret for a while. Um, and and the, one of the biggest concerns was really the walk to and from the car. So creating a smaller handheld version, um, whether it's one that they keep with them all the time or it's one that they can just borrow and take to and from, adding those types of products and continuing that feedback with them um, to be able to give them the best tools that they need for the type of situations that they face um, has been a really an ongoing relationship between Reflex Protect and our healthcare clients. So it's not just like, hi, here's a box of stuff, um, good luck. It's, hi, we're here to help you with your workplace violence problem. We're here to help you with your, your safety and security overall. Let's talk and, and let's exchange ideas. Um, and we're gonna teach you how to use these tools. And if you need something, we might very well develop a new tool for you. That's, that's really great. I love that it's a, it's a partnership. It's not just like you said, dropping off a box of products. Um, let's move on to budgets. Obviously, you know, that's the one thing that comes to mind. The first thing when somebody says, Hey, I have something that can help you. Well, how much does it cost? Um, you know, when can either of you or, or both of you kind of uh, discuss when implementing these safety and security measures, how they can pay for themselves or actually save the hospital or facility a lot of money in the long run. Go ahead, Sean. Yeah. It, you know, it, it, it's interesting. Um, because that is always the, the, the battle is where's the money coming from? And, and like I said, especially in a time of, of COVID, the, the healthcare organizations are really, really strapped for cash. But I tell you what, you have to invest in your, your staff. You have to invest in your caregivers. And um, what's, what's a, an important statistic is it costs approximately $44,000 to replace a nurse. So at, at a point in our workplace violence prevention program, we had a nurse who was on the floor for about six months who was assaulted by a patient, pushed up against the wall, um, punched several times, and was obviously significantly impacted physically and emotionally. And, you know, eventually that particular nurse had an issue returning to work, obviously. But what a stressful situation for a brand new nurse. So when you think about it, it costs approximately $44,000 just to replace one nurse. Never mind you, you think about um, compassion fatigue and, and people having problems returning to work and, and leave of absences. To invest in a product that, you know, literally costs $20 for one bottle, and you think about how to deploy that across your hospital, it's a minor investment. Never mind, let's go back to that empower people. Think about how their day is better because they're not worried about what's going to happen in that stressful situation. They're not going to think about what is going on when they hear a loud scream and do I run to that? Do I walk away from that? How do I help? Well, now you know what you're going to do. Never mind, you know, let's look at some of the regulations out there. There have been some significant fines from healthcare organizations not addressing the need to implement work, solid, sound workplace violence prevention programs and to provide tools for people to protect themselves. Joint Commission uh, came out, I think it was uh, 2018, Sentinel event number 59, that said, you will train all staff to some level of workplace violence. And you will provide a tool 
for them to physically protect themselves if need be. And what is that tool? So not only were we answering, answering some of the, the regulatory requirements, we were empowering them to protect themselves, telling them they could protect themselves and providing them with that tool to do that. So that, that was a very small cost investment to really provide that safer environment, to provide a tool to respond to, to healthcare workplace violence, and to also you know, work closely with some of the regulatory bodies to say, hey, not only did we, we find an answer, we've impl implemented that answer as well. Well, th thanks for sharing that. And I know that you are you are very, very busy and we greatly appreciate you taking time to chat with us today. So um, before we wrap up today, I want to transition to adding in Alan Baris, the director of active defense training and Healthcare division for Reflect Protect, who I know, Sean, you've worked with. Uh, but if you could help us set up that intro and talk about your experience with training using the Reflect Protect system. Yeah, you know, it, it was really important to me to find people who understood the healthcare environment. And, and I had been working with Alan in the healthcare environment with some of our armed intruder training. And, and he quickly understood the need. He quickly understood the vulnerability of healthcare violence and the fact that this isn't in the nature of healthcare workers to respond to this violence. So to then um, bring in somebody uh, like Alan with his background to assist in the training and implementation of Reflex Protect in healthcare, in other, other types of business settings, it was just a great partnership and, and absolutely the, the right person to bring in to, to help with that and just an incredible trainer. Great. Well, welcome, Alan. Thank you very much for joining us. Yeah, thank you guys for having me here, and thank you for that introduction, Sean. Appreciate it. If you could, Alan, if you could share um, the importance of preparation in the form of training, um, you know, tell us why it's such a crucial part of the full Reflex Protect solution. Certainly, and I think Sean, you know, touched on it earlier. The most important thing about the training is to ensure that people are comfortable, confident with their ability to use, whether it's the bigger can or even training with the inerts for the smaller can, we want people to be comfortable with it and competent. And that increases their empowerment. You know, we've talked about earlier, you said people feel empowered. It's because they are confident with the tool because they've trained. Secondarily, the training is important for what was already mentioned earlier for policy reasons. If your policy says we are giving this tool to people and the training to people, if it's ever used, that you know, law enforcement, lawyers, those people are going to come back and they're going to look at the use of the product and what the policies say. And the policies say people had training, then they're going to look at what that training was. So it's important to, for people to be confident and competent with the tool. But it's also important for the lawyers, risk managers and stuff to have that policy in place that protects the individual and the institution if it's ever actually used. That makes sense. And I, I like the whole cohesive thought through the entire process of that. Can you walk us through what a typical day of training for a medical group would look like? Certainly. And we offer a variety of trainings. So we, we offer programs on de-escalation skills. We offer programs on armed and shooter, active shooter response, and those are longer programs. But when you get to the actual reflex protect user training, which you can be certified to go along with those policy requirements, that entails an interactive lecture where people have a chance to ask and have questions answered, really learning what the products are. You know, what Presidia Gel is, what Reflex Remove is, how they work, what they do. And then a very important part of the training, when and when not to use them. With examples and situations where the instructor will quiz people in the class to make sure they fully understand what situations can be, you, you can use the product and when you can't. Sean earlier mentioned how an event turns it from helping a patient into a criminal event. And that's what's very important in healthcare. 
it needs to be a criminal event, which is the assault, trying to hurt somebody in that hospital. It's not used for patient management. And then finally, the training involves using one of the inerts and actually practicing. So you know how to use the trigger, remove that if it's in place. You know how to use the safeties up and down and you've actually sprayed it at targets. And after people are comfortable with spraying it, we include some spraying with a little induced stress. Well, it's not the same stress of an actual event. It is enough to get people a little excited and make them work faster. So they become more confident and competent using it in a stressful situation. So speaking of training, thank you for sharing that. Uh, Joe, I wanna have you talk for a minute or two about how this has now transitioned or moved into law enforcement. You know, this product was designed specifically for healthcare, but now law enforcement have seen it as a basically game-changing product. <clears throat> That's exactly right. And 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 there's actually an, an, another example, I think, in uh, uh, of, of where that happened that was an interesting crossroads uh, that ties into to similar to one of Sean's stories, which is um, that we had, we had, uh, originally started with healthcare and we went to schools. And then um, when COVID came, uh, we found that they all had a lot to worry about. Um, but interestingly, at the same time, law enforcement was starting to become more and more familiar with what we had. And there was more and more uh, emphasis on um, use of force and excessive use of force or even use of lethal lethal force and so they were starting to revisit some of their less lethal products and they began to look at the opportunity that that we had for law enforcement to be able to use this sooner in an engagement um, and with much more confidence uh, than they might have pepper sprays um, and without having to go up to higher levels of use of force like taser, certainly not lethal force, and none of the hands-on activity. And so when officers started to realize, wait a minute, I know this spray was, was really made for caregivers or school teachers, at least that's what they had in mind, but it works incredibly well. It's really fast. Um, I can spray it and hit just the person that I want to spray. That person will generally take an E. Um, and I can restrain them quickly and then I can clean them up and nobody else is going to be affected. This is actually a very powerful law enforcement tool um, as well. It gave law enforcement something that they didn't really have before because um, even though pepper spray would do some of those things, it wasn't as fast acting uh, and it would frequently affect a whole lot of other people. Um, and so it, it didn't solve the problem in, in the same way. So even though it was being used but for a different purpose, um, it, it had the same outcome. We had an interesting situation in Indianapolis not too long ago where uh, someone was actually arrested, um, a very large man, 300 pounds, and, and came into the hospital because um, I think there, you know, a lot of times they'll take people for either mental health or because there's been an altercation out in the streets to the hospital first, as Sean suggested. And um, this person got violent in the hospital and there were both officers and security and uh, caregivers all around and it immediately became a, a dangerous situation. What was interesting was one of the people that we had recently trained uh, in as an instructor in the use of uh, Presidia gel, uh, Reflex Protect Presidia gel w was there uh, on a different call unrelated to what was happening here. And he saw this going down in the, in the hospital. Um, and, and he walked over with his reflex protect and, and sprayed Presidia gel on the, uh, on the, the guy and boom, just like usual, he took a knee and they shackled him all up and he was still freaking out and everything like that. But what was really interesting was what happened next was the caregivers then came in and began to remove the um, the Presidia gel using the reflex remove that the officer had. He said, hey, this will work fast. Go ahead and try to use this. And as he became more comforted by the reflex remove being used, he became calm. He was terrified and and acting out and acting violently and, and, uh, and he was dangerous. But once he had been stopped, uh, and then as the pain began to go away quickly and he realized that people weren't there to hurt him, 
They were actually there to help him. He calmed down. So it's an extraordinary situation of law enforcement being involved, healthcare being involved, and really being able to see uh, the the uh, the use of the product um, in a in a way that was better for everyone involved. None of the none of the cops got hurt. The the perpetrator didn't get hurt. None of the caregivers got hurt, and no one else in the hospital was was troubled at all. No one else even had to know what was going on. The hospital continued on in its operations. So we're seeing that, you know, there have been other cases didn't happen in hospitals that, ha that happened on regular calls by law enforcement or um, in other circumstances. And as Sean pointed out, lots and lots of cases where they don't even have to spray it. Lots of situations in which just brandishing it and letting somebody know that you are ready to spray them will stop them in their tracks. Um, so it's it's been an extraordinary journey getting to healthcare and then seeing how by solving that problem, we actually created a set of uh, tools that can solve a lot of problems out there that are very exciting. Yeah, and an, an incredible journey, I would say, is the perfect way to, to phrase it. And it's only the beginning of the journey. Can you share, Joe, what you think about the future looks like, how Reflex Protect can help healthcare you know, where you see this going? Well, I, I think the idea is is the minimization of suffering on all sides. Um, you know, that was that was really what what Sean brought to this, um, I think, early on was the understanding that, look, nobody. This is a hospital. This is supposed to be a place of healing. Everybody should be trying to feel better here, whether it's just the stress of worrying about uh, whether or not uh, you're going to have a safe walk to and from the car, whether or not a patient is going to go off on you today, uh, whether if you're a patient there, something else is going to happen. Um, you're, you're worried about your friend or your loved one that is in the hospital. Being able to create an environment in which people are more confident um, that workplace violence isn't going to happen uh, and that they can protect themselves, that they're self-empowered to do that, um, or that their loved ones are self-empowered to do that, that has, I think, an extraordinary opportunity to improve actual the service of healthcare, um, you know, employee retention, morale, um, and the ability to for for hospitals to do the the, the best work that they can, um, especially as things get tougher, uh, you know, during these these times of COVID, and and we start to to notice more and more about it. So, um, it's it's a very nice opportunity there. The other thing that I think is interesting as well um, that was unique because of it coming out of healthcare was people from differing viewpoints. Um, are more accepting of this than they might have been uh, of other things. Um, sort of there's something about hospital safe and that like, well, if a nurse is going to be able to use this, you know, okay, let, let's talk about, uh, you know, is that okay or not okay? And so, for example, we've had police unions on one side say, yes, this is a better spray for us. It works faster. It takes the guy down. It doesn't affect anybody else. And we've had people from the ACLU say, yes, please use that spray. That's great. It takes the guy down quickly um, and you don't have to escalate use of force. And those were people that might not have been able to agree on, on this type of an issue in the past, but because this tool came out of healthcare and from that compassionate background, there seems to be an ability for people to talk about it in ways that they otherwise might not have been able to. And that's just been extraordinary. That is that is truly extraordinary. I think that's a great word for that. And I, you know, we we've had a great discussion today, and I know that this is literally just the tip of the iceberg on this topic. And I want to thank the three of you so much for coming together. I'm sure that we'll have many more conversations as we unpack this topic. Uh, I want to invite the people watching to visit our website, reflexprotect.com. On there, we have other blogs, and we do have a white paper uh, talking further about this topic. You can find us on social media at Reflex Protect US. Thank you very much, and we will see you next time. Thanks, everybody. Thanks.